hello, I'm Michael Lampert. I'm a healthcare partner at Ropes and Gray, and I'm here today with Brad Power, who is co-founder and president of Cancer Patient Lab. I'd like to start maybe, Brad, with your story. How did you come to do what you're doing? Well, I'm a process innovation consultant by background. Uh, that means that I help large organizations use technology to change the way they do their work. And I have also written over 75 articles for the Harvard Business Review, so I'm also kind of a journalist, a bit of a writer. And I was diagnosed with lymphoma in 2018 and decided that I would focus my work around uh, applying those skills, whether it's consulting or whether it's writing, to help people with cancer. Tell me about the beginning of Cancer Patient Lab then. Cancer Patient Lab came about really because of a wonderful man named Bryce Olson who just passed. Bryce was a metastatic prostate cancer patient. He had been through eight lines of therapy in eight years. I was speaking to, to Bryce now a couple years ago around Christmas, and um, he said, I've hit a wall, Brad. I've run out of treatment options. Because what happens is you have these biomarkers and you get drugs, and they, they, they basically block some of those pathways. But at a point, you run out of if you try them and they fail, you try it and it fails, you try a treatment and it fails, and eventually you run out. He says, I'm hit, I've hit a wall. I said, well, we could run a hackathon for you, not knowing fully what that meant. But in my mind, it was we were going to crowdsource a group of people that would come together to help him out. And he said, yeah, let's do it. And so he brought a bunch of people that he knew. He was a, you know, a very uh, charismatic guy. He had a big presence and following. Over the course of what I'd been doing, I'd identified and met a lot of people, you know, like maybe 100, 150 people. And um, we invited them to come to some sessions that we held on Zoom and then helped him figure out what was his best next treatment option. So that kind of got the ball rolling on running hackathons and crowdsourcing for patients. And then the idea was to scale that up. So once you do a hackathon for one patient, you know three important things. Who are the experts? What are the testing options you should consider? And what are the treatment options? And so we could do that for the next patient who came along who looked like Bryce. And so the idea was that we should establish the prostate cancer lab and have patients come that wanted to go through the same process of learning, maybe a hackathon. And we started a webinar series to allow um, subject matter experts to come and educate us about what the latest tests were, what the latest treatments were. And over time, we've gradually, through word of mouth, grown from two initial patients, my co-founders, uh, Brian McCluskey and Rick Stanton, to somewhere north of 30 um, pa patients, very active, engaged uh, patients, prostate cancer patients. And then the prostate cancer lab became the cancer patient lab because when you do this kind of analysis, it's true of all cancers, so that if you have a mutation, let's say a BRCA or an EFGR, there are these, you know, these four-letter alphabet soups. If you have one of those, the territory you're in is cancer independent, so that you can have those variations, even though it's typically someone who has breast cancer or ovarian cancer, but it could actually be somebody who has lung cancer and or prostate cancer. So once you get into this zone of really detailed analysis, diagnostics, and then treatment options, it's pretty much the same for all advanced cancers. So in our delusions of grandeur, we called it Cancer Patient Lab, and it's starting to bear fruit. We're already having conversations about working in brain cancer and, and uh, pancreatic cancer. Wow, so who, who hacks? Who Describe a hackathon. So yeah, hack is an interesting word because um, for people in software, which is my background, Hacking is a good thing. That's a clever person who's come up with a way to do something, maybe a workaround. Crowdsource, you get a bunch of people together, diverse set of experts. Typically a hackathon by software people is done over a weekend. And so it's time bound. I recognized that patients don't fit in a weekend, that their disease evolves, their treatment evolves, they run experiments, they work, they don't. So it's more about staying with them. But we, we hung on to the name in that a hackathon, for me, is a group of people that come together to help a patient figure out what they should do. Talk about the patient, if you would, for a little bit. What, what patient would benefit most? Who, who should think about this? So first of all, we're working on advanced cancer, which means that patients have been through the standard of care. Standard of care is usually the programmatic steps you follow. So I had lymphoma. 
you know, if you have lymphoma, you get a course of chemotherapy. And you can choose your kind of chemotherapy, but it's, that's the standard of care. That's what everybody administers because it's got an evidence base behind it. We know what will happen. We know if there are side effects, how we treat them. Many patients, many cancers, they're lucky enough in a way, they survive beyond the standard of care. And now it's like, maybe they're clinical trials, but you're basically in kind of off-road. You're not so more, much on a straight path. You're on, you're, now you're off-road driving and there's no map. And so we're helping those patients. Um, and in particular, people that are highly engaged. Uh, one of our mantras is more engaged patients get better outcomes. Educated patients get better outcomes. So those are the people we look for, people that are interested in learning, people that are interested in educating themselves about their disease. Are there stories that, that, that sit with you? So one of our patients did a proteomic analysis and found that um, there was a particular chemotherapy that was normally used for lung cancer, but he had prostate cancer, and that it was a better, more effective chemotherapy for him. Another patient, one of my co-founders, Rick Stanton, found that he had B7H3, which is showing up in his RNA sequencing and his proteomics, and that there's a drug that addresses B7H3. It's a common biomarker for people with cancer and a new area. So we are helping patients become aware that there's more than DNA sequencing and that if they get this proteomics or RNA sequencing, that that can then allow them to find more treatments to add to their menu of treatment options. What's the clinician sort of versus patient ratio? Clinicians are busy Monday through Friday, nine to five in lab, uh, in, I mean in clinic. Um, and so it, to get them to participate in a weekly webinar just is not a good fit for the way they operate. If you schedule enough in advance, we can get them to be a discussion leader or presenter. And if you have questions, you can send them something that they can answer on email in about three minutes. So if you basically say, we've got a patient that looks like this, and do you, have you ever seen anybody like that? Or we've got somebody who's considering this, would you say A or B or C or yes or no? If you have questions like that, they can handle that, and then they can respond and will respond. And so we have a number of clinicians who are on that kind of, it's like, kind of like having them on speed dial. We consider them friends and family. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a community description where I've, I've listed a number of those. Um, you know, they're, they're the leading lights of, of cancer research. They're typically MD, PhDs, so they're both scientists and doctors. The other thing that we found is that we have such smart patients because they've considered all this stuff and talked to all the experts. Many of these patients have gone and scoured all the top academic research centers and, and, and taken their cases to those people. So if you have a question, um, if a patient has a question, the other patients can often answer it as well as any of those leading doctors because they have basically run the, run the territory and have answered those questions for themselves. Right, I think a little bit of the story was, I guess, 12 years ago, something like that, when Ted Kennedy was sick. And I think of him having a conference of all of the clinicians to figure out what to do. Yeah, It sounds like this is, is in a way, a piece of that, but yeah, it's it is. a piece of that for, for more than just one. I remember the, there's a famous management uh, guru called Peter Drucker, and I once heard him present, and he said that FDR, um, Roosevelt, had only one doctor, and the one doctor did some things wrong and missed some things, and if only he had had more doctors, they would have probably more correctly diagnosed him. And so what's common in cancer is everyone should get a second opinion. And the, the notion of this crowd, crowd approach is that if a second opinion is good, would a third, a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth opinion be good? Yeah. And what happens is that people come with completely different perspectives. There are, um, two, one of the biggest divides is between the people who are molecular biologists and the clinicians. So molecular biologists are the ones that are figuring out how to model what disease is and, and you know, diving deep into the tumor, the tumor dynamics, the chemistry of it, the tumor microenvironment, what's going on around, and all this, this fancy new stuff that's just like the frontier. And that's only slowly making its way over to the clinicians who are prescribing day to day what patients should do. And so that's, that's one big uh, 
it, you know, would, would not be obvious, I think, to an average person or patient that that divide exists. And so, so you come at this not as a lawyer, right? You come at this with a, a non-law background. Um, not a lawyer, not a medical, and not a biology. Like, I have none of those things. Yeah. <laughs> and so as a, as a problem solver, as, as a consultant, but... Um, Primarily focusing on a decision process. How do people make these decisions? When did you think that you needed some law? And what do you see as a role of a lawyer for helping patients like you, patients like your friends and your colleagues and your organization? You start off as a startup, like we were, as a, you know, you call it a mom and pop. We were just, a, a, you know, just a couple people working on the, on our personal accounts. It was my Zoom account, you know, my my Google Calendar, and you just get going. And at a point, you want to be able to scale up and help more people. You don't want to, you want, you want, if you want to have more impact, you want to impact more people. And at a point, that means you should really be a legal entity, uh, and be able to take in money and pay for services, not just do it all on volunteer on a volunteer basis. What's your, um, what's your dream for, for Cancer Patient Lab five years from now or two years from now? Uh, scaling up. So for me, it's always impacting more patients. So it'd be more patients. It would be, um, again, if we're 30 today, it would be 100, 1,000, something like that, thereby having more impact not only on those patients but as a secondary effect. Brad, thanks for coming. My pleasure. Thank you.